This week on Motoring 90. That's a dangerous location where you go to the guy who's so insane that you're doing that you're doing. It. Credibility really is something that takes you a long time to build up. And, and the way to do that is that you can't say what you really don't know. Motoring 90 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. This week on Motoring 90, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, traffic. And we're going to begin by introducing you to Big Brother. That's right, whether you know it or not, Big Brother is watching you. That's not bad, that's good. This is not the flight deck for the Starship Enterprise. But like the Enterprise, the men and women in this room are pioneering new frontiers. This is the District Traffic Operations Center run by the Ministry of Transportation. This center is controlling freeway traffic management along the 401 Highway in Metropolitan Toronto. It's a sort of big brother of traffic, and it could be coming to a freeway near you. We don't like to think of ourselves as the big brother. Uh, hopefully, uh, what we're doing is monitoring the, the roadway through the use of uh, sensors embedded in the roadway, wire loop detectors, which are actually sunk into the pavement and spaced about every 500 meters. And these sensors detect the presence of traffic, the movement of traffic, and, we'll, and this information is transmitted back to computers here at the control center. Now, when there's a traffic problem on the roadway, these sensors uh, via the computer notify the operators here that there's a problem. And then they can respond and usually what they do first is check the problem using we have closed circuit television cameras which are spaced about every kilometer along the roadway. So they can use these and these cameras have a full pan, tilt and zoom capability so we can zoom in and check what the problem is and then we can respond to that problem. Maybe the most common problem might be something like a, a stalled vehicle on a hot summer day and where for whatever reason the vehicle stalls and it's sitting in a, in a lane, a moving traffic lane and of course that's potentially extremely dangerous and, and also it starts to cause congestion and for each minute that vehicle is there it's going to cause during rush hour anyways about 10 minutes of congestion. So that once the operator spotted that he may do several things. First of all he'll probably uh, notify the police or the towing services or, and get, get people moving in terms of responding and send them to the right place with the right equipment. The other thing he can do is he can notify the motorist of the problem. We, we are presently installing some changeable message signs at strategic locations so that as a motorist is approaching that area he may be warned that he's going to need to slow down uh, because there's, there's a problem ahead. And so hopefully that way we can reduce the danger and reduce many of the rear-end collisions which are so common on freeways when there's a sudden change in speed. We occasionally do catch accidents or in some cases secondary accidents where the accidents already occurred and because of the traffic problems that produces our operator is notified via the computer. When he zooms in it's not that uncommon to see another accident happening um, as people tr all of a sudden have to slow down and, and we're either going too fast or because of the weather conditions couldn't stop and of course they run into the back of the queue. A lot of people are often in shock when an accident occurs and sometimes they don't do very rational things. There are also a lot of people who don't realize how dangerous it is to be out walking around on the freeway while the traffic is moving around them. And we have a lot of people who take incredible chances such as trying to run across the freeway when the traffic volume is very heavy or uh, stand out sort of in a live, what we call a live or a moving freeway lane after the accident and seem to wander around. And, and the potential for a additional tragedy is very great. This system has a lot of new technology. We're using fiber optics for our communication subsystem, which is a first, I believe, in North America, if not in the world. And we're also using a new type of technology for our changeable signs, which is a first in North America as well. Well, well I was still waiting for somebody to get to that uh, guy who's changing the tire. This is also our radio room uh, for all of our district vehicles 
uh, such as whether it's snow plows or our road patrol trucks, our emergency patrol vehicles, that, are, that help to maintain the highway system. And so it's very important that they work together with the freeway traffic management operators so that if there's a load spilled on the roadway or whatever, we can mobilize the people quickly and take, get out a loader or a sander or whatever's needed to clear that problem. That's a dangerous location where he is. The guy is almost insane to be doing that, he's doing. It's not too bad if you're on the other side of the car, but on this side of the car, I guess traffic is bad. That's a dangerous spot. Is he still there? Yeah, he's got the wheel off and he's uh, looking at it. But I don't know what... Uh, if he's got a spare out yet or not, I don't. Uh, he's like he got a donut. Now, what, what, what the right procedure for him to do is sit there and wait until somebody comes along and protects him. That's what the e vehicle will do when he, get, he, get, when he gets there. Because once you get the truck behind it with an arrow or a light sign, it'll give him protection. But he's only, he's only, what, a couple of feet away from the white line. The system was not designed for enforcement. And for instance, uh, some people have asked us about speed enforcement, and there's, there's much more efficient and better ways for the police to do speed enforcement. Uh, what we do do, though, is we work very closely with the police so that when there is a problem, an accident or something like that, we have very good communication with the police and we can help them to get there faster and know what to expect when they get there. Were you surprised at how quickly that uh, these men got here? Yeah, I was. Yeah. I didn't know who they were, to tell you the truth. Were you aware that there are cameras, TV cameras, along this highway uh, watching you? Uh, no, I wasn't, no. Well, I saw cameras yesterday on the highway, but I wasn't sure what they were for. I thought they were for speeding. I think it would be a mistake to, to think that this is going to solve all our problems. It, it won't. It really just helps us to manage the problems. And I, I'd like to stress it's just part of the solution to our transportation problems. It's not the, the answer to everything. So who did produce the first minivan? Stay tuned. On Test Drive, we look at the second generation of the original minivan. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. Well, believe it or not, Toyota actually pipped Chrysler to the post in the race to pull the wraps off the first garageable minivan. Now this, the 1991 Previa, is the vehicle Toyota are pinning their hopes on to garner a bigger share of the market, which is dominated by the Chrysler Magic Wagons. The Previa is by far and away the best looking minivan on the market at the moment. During the test, it earned a surprisingly high number of compliments on both its appearance and interior finish. This van complies with all passenger car safety regulations, with the exception of five mile an hour bumpers. Now this is a definite step in the right direction because most minivans totally ignore some of the more important aspects of these regulations. A high seating position and a large greenhouse provide the driver with good all round visibility, as well as giving the interior a light airy feel. The dash, while conveying all important information, unfortunately features limited instrumentation. A neat pod that protrudes from the dash panel ensures the climate control and radio are within arm's reach with the remainder of the driving controls falling readily to hand. The Previa's power is supplied by a 2.4 litre 16 valve 4 cam engine that has been modified to allow it to lie at a 75 degree angle beneath the front seats. Also under the hood is the engine's oil reservoir. Should the engine use any oil, the reservoir replaces it, thereby maintaining the correct level between oil changes. I think locating this reservoir right next to the washer bottle is a mistake, which could lead to costly confusion for unsuspecting owners. Gaining access to check the transmission fluid level is accomplished by lifting the driver's seat and removing a panel. Getting to the business end of the engine, however, is more difficult. To do this, you must remove a total of 17 bolts and three screws. In a demonstration provided by Toyota, Peggy Allen, a member of the PR team, managed this feat in a little over seven and a half minutes without the aid of power tools. And this may seem like a lot of work to replace the spark plugs, but with the change interval spaced at 100,000 kilometers, even the most ardent do-it-yourself should only have to face this chore two or three times in the vehicle's life. 
Inside our test Toyota was fully optioned featuring an ice maker, dual sunroofs, a roof mounted air conditioner unit for the rear passengers and a full ABS system that worked to perfection during the test. Unlike the competition, the Previa's rear seats fold up out of the way revealing a wide flat floor pan. When measured between the wheel arches it missed the four foot mark by a titch, I suspect because of the trim covering said arches. The two centre captain's chairs are bolted in place which makes removal somewhat labour intensive but does provide a safer platform for mounting a child seat. Also all outboard passengers are treated to three point seat belts. This engine suffices very nicely for everyday use, however get a full complement of passengers and luggage on board and it leaves a lot to be desired. As you can see the location does not allow for the installation of a V6 option either something that may end up spoiling a very nice van. Now to the scoreboard and see how I rated the rest of the 1991 Previa. The Previa handles very well, boasts a compact turning circle and demonstrated a surprisingly small susceptibility to side winds. That said, this van, like all the others, has to be treated with respect when it comes to high speed maneuvers. On rough roads, a lot of the jolts are passed directly onto the passengers, unfortunately. All minivans suffer from unusual weight distribution problems which can make the rear brakes lock prematurely. This in a panic stop can prove more than a little disconcerting. This makes the anti-lock brake system a very welcome option because ABS looks after this situation perfectly. Our rear wheel drive Previa hustled to the 100k mark in just over 14 seconds. This was with just me on board. Add some passengers and the time becomes even more leisurely. Surprisingly, there is very little engine noise except at wide open throttle acceleration, and for a van with such a large expanse of glass, there is little wind noise. During the test, we managed to average 12 litres per 100 kilometres, or 23.5 miles per gallon. Overall, the Previa is a well-executed, well-built minivan. These attributes are sure to generate a lot of consumer interest. However, the lack of a more potent powertrain may end up haunting Toyota. We're now standing in a very dangerous area alongside the 401. It is rush hour right now, and with me from the Ministry of Transportation is Tom O'Rourke. And Tom, obviously it can get extremely dangerous out here for you and for motorists. What advice would you give to somebody who gets a flat tire or their vehicle stalls out here? Uh, when your vehicle stalls or if you have a flat tire, try and get off onto the shoulder of the road. Uh, maybe put your four-way flashers on, put your hood up. Uh, basically stay in your vehicle until help help arrives. Uh, if you do have to get out of your vehicle, try and face traffic so you know what is going on all the time, because things happen very fast. Yeah, we'll stay safe out there, okay? okay. All right, we're now going to join a man who certainly knows how to fix a flat tire, but he's smart enough not to do anything silly and try and change one out here. I'm talking, of course, about our chief mechanic, Bill Gardner, so let's join Bill in the shop. Well, Brad, I'm glad it's you on the side of the highway and not me. But here's a job that every motorist should do once in a while, a simple inspection that any motorist can make. Turn the wheels full left or full right lock so that they come out of the wheel opening and you can get a good look at the tire. You can see about half the diameter of the tire here. You can inspect it for any damage or uneven wear as a result of misalignment. You can see that this tire is still in good condition on both sides. It has full tread depth almost and this tire would be quite safe in the rain. As we move farther inboard on the suspension, you can see the lower control arm, and you can see the constant velocity joint here, the outboard one, and the boot that protects it. And in this particular car, the boot is, has been damaged. It's gashed open here. Here's half of a piece of it over here, and here's the main body of it here. And the constant velocity joint inside, it's quite a precision joint, and all the grease that normally lubricates it has become contaminated with dirt. And that's uh, our topic today. We're going to take this apart and show you how it's serviced and repaired. Now this operation that we're doing today is particular only to front wheel drive cars. We're talking about constant velocity or CV joints. And this boot that's ripped would only be found on a front wheel drive type car or a four wheel drive vehicle. So what we have to do is remove this entire half shaft or prop shaft that drives the front wheels. One end is attached to the transaxle, the other end is splined to the hub that drives the wheel around. So we have to remove that and the first thing we have to do is remove this large nut. We've removed the large nut that secures the axle to the hub and we use a soft hammer to loosen 
the shaft in the splines of the hub. Now we have to separate the lower ball joint and we're going to remove the pinch bolt that holds that ball joint stud in tight. Okay. Now we have to pry the lower control arm down slightly in order to disengage that bolt. There's a little bit of tension left on it. It doesn't want to come out. There it's out. Now we have to pry the arm down a little bit further to disengage the lower ball joint. This isn't easy. Hmm. There. Okay, we've disengaged the ball joint stud from the bottom of the knuckle. And we can, you can see that you can really swing the suspension out now, pull it out. And we're going to use the soft hammer to tap the outside of the shaft in. It's pushing through those splines now. We keep pulling it back until we disengage it from the knuckle. It's completely out now. You can see the splines that normally drive the hub and the wheel. And you can get a real good look at that joint now. The next step is to jar the inboard end of this shaft and release it from the transaxle. Then we can go to the bench and repair it. And that's exactly what we're going to do next week. Disassemble this joint and repair it. Till then, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 90. Found from around Bayview all the way through past Islington over to about Dixon Martin Grove. The reason some earlier uh, problems through Islington cleared up and then eastbound problems at Dixon Martin Grove. The left lane is locked. East 414. problems out there, no problems in here, that's the way it should go. <laughs> it stays that way, we're in good shape. Okay. We've seen how modern technology is trying to cope with traffic chaos, but we're now going to join Steve Grant. He has a story about another method of traffic control. This one is much older, but it's still very popular. You know, it's hardly unusual these days to see a cellular phone inside a van or a car. I mean, it's pretty well a required luxury. But for the hundreds, if not thousands of people who commute in and out of the city every day, their real lifeline are the radio traffic reports. Eastbound 401 is reopened. It was closed around Mugger Road. Also, according to our callers, East specifically, we have problems. The daily bumper to bumper conditions have produced a bumper crop of radio traffic reporters. Reporting gridlock is nothing new. It began a good 30 years ago, but radio programmers are aware now more than ever that the station that stays on top of traffic will likely be on top in the ratings race as well. CHFI FM 98 with Paul McCartney. Man, it's 8.30 and he does in fact give a hoot about your route. Here's CHFI traffic and Russ Holden. Thanks, Sandy. Southbound 404 Parkway, not too bad. Parkway is 7. As we find people tuning us off. in morning and afternoon drive as much for the traffic as for the music and perhaps more so uh, on certain days. We've had two planes up for 10 years or more. I, I've, I've lost track of how many. Uh, I've been here 10 years and we've always had the planes up, both of them. I think you've got to have two planes. We were even thinking of three at one time. And you've got to have your ground sources. Uh, if you just sit in a room, usually what happens in a case like that, and it happens with us all the time, is people monitor our reports and scribble it down and then uh, five minutes later go on the air with those reports. Well, five minutes later, the, the situation has changed. What we see, and what a lot of people may be surprised, is that we very seldom, very seldom see an accident actually happen. Russ Holden has been waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning for 17 years to fly over the city of Toronto. His job is to steer you and I away from the next pileup. Credibility really is something that takes you a long time to build up. And, and the way to do that is that you can't say what you really don't know. Uh, like if there's a problem on the parkway and I haven't seen that problem for 15 minutes and the chance that it's cleared up at that point, I'm not going to say the parkway is jammed down to Lawrence because of an accident. I'll say the parkway was solid down to Lawrence when I saw it last. And that's true. You have to be truthful about it. They, they say to me, they say, oh, it must be nice to go flying, you know, all day long, listen to records, talk, but what you see, great. Busy, you're constantly juggling. You're constantly changing priorities. What's important at the moment? Air traffic control, radio station. Uh, safety's got to be the number one item. It has to be first. But uh, it's always a change. 
You're talking to me, I can talk to you now. If somebody else calls me, I'll stop in the middle of the conversation because it's more important than you are at the moment. Right now, they're calling me. Safety has always been a concern, even when Eddie Luther began reporting way back in 1961. Eddie was the first, and in most people's opinions, probably the best traffic reporter ever. I don't think that they thought it would be, you know, that useful. But it was a novelty, and uh, the helicopter itself was a novelty, and doing traffic was a novelty. So uh, uh, then it did uh, prove itself to be useful. So then everyone else started doing it shortly after that. You know, we relied strictly on what we saw. But now, uh, with their immediate contact with all these other areas, they can do a much better job. People want to listen to traffic reports for basically three reasons. First of all. There are the people that are prepared to take an alternate route. He is the, the active listener. You have the listener who will stay with the parkway, but he wants to know where the problem is and what's happening to know about how long he's going to be there. He calculates, but he stays with the route. And then there's the third listener who goes down the parkway no matter what. You can tell him it's closed. You can tell him there's a 15-foot hole across the entire parkway, and he'll still go down the parkway. But he just wants to know what's happening. Thursday. Generally speaking, Thursday is the lightest day of the week. I don't really know why. I don't know whether people uh, go in early Thursday so they'll get all their work done so they can leave on Friday. Thursday morning and afternoon, generally speaking, are lighter than any other day of the week. Friday morning is the next lightest day, and Friday afternoon is the worst. And there's almost a, an inverse rule of Fridays that we have. If it's very light Friday morning, it's very heavy Friday afternoon. And it almost always follows. Brian, I'm looking downtown right now at the Gardner Bolter. I enjoy getting up uh, and flying. I love to fly. And that, that really is the icing on the cake for me. And I enjoy the job. It's always different. Are you frustrated by traffic? I've got a solution for you coming up next on Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Get out of my way, you stupid jerk. Can't you see I'm in a hurry? Well, as you can tell, I'm not really driving. But I used to drive that way, and because of the frustration of traffic in our cities today, a lot of people still do. But I finally figured it out. If you live 10 miles from the office, and you can average 40 miles an hour instead of 35 miles an hour, you're only going to get there 128 seconds sooner. Now, is 128 seconds worth a heart attack or a brain aneurysm? Not to me. I want to live to see 40. OK, I want to live to see 50. Now, maybe you've seen that television commercial on another network where the driver is all upset and he's mad and he's got rock and roll on the radio and he finally turns on Jurgen Goff on CBC FM and he mellows right down and just enjoys himself. Well, that's a strategy you might want to consider. If you're into pop music, forget about Aerosmith. Put on a little James Taylor. If you're into classical music, try some Mozart and leave the Wagner tape at home. Now, the producers of this show will tell you I'm the last guy who should be talking about getting someplace on time. But if you really have to be somewhere 128 seconds sooner, why don't you leave home 128 seconds earlier? This is Jim Kenzie for Motoring 90. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed this special edition on the headaches of traffic and the people who are working hard to try and make life easier for all us drivers. And incidentally, if you happen to be looking in from a small, picturesque Canadian town with no traffic problems, believe me, count your blessings every night. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more of Motoring 90. Motoring 90 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will.